Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. Today we will be discussing influential word choice. My name is Patrick Allen. I'm the program manager for Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development's public open enrollment programs. Our center specializes in providing employee development for partnering organizations in Northeast Ohio and around the country. We offer training as public open enrollment programs delivered in Independence, Ohio, and also on-site customized programs delivered at your location. I am joined today by Kent State Facilitator Deborah Easton. I will be serving as your host, and Deborah will be our presenter for today. Deborah has been a communications coach for over 30 years and provides audiences with practical and effective advice for communicating with colleagues, customers, and direct reports. Her techniques for one-to-one -one -one interactions and group communications provide participants with practical strategies for handling difficult exchanges. She adapts every program to the needs of the unique organizational cultures and the individual learner. She has partnered with Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development to provide a broad range of communication skills programs to many of our clients, such as NASA Glenn Research Center, the Metro Health System, Automated Packaging Systems, the Cleveland Clinic, and St. Cobain. Her most requested training topics include interpersonal communication skills, coaching accountability, effective listening, dealing with difficult behaviors, and her always popular communication strategies for generations working together. Prior to her work in facilitating professional development programs for adults, Deborah taught communication courses in Kent State University's Center or Department for Communication Studies, where she supervised 40 instructors of the Speech Fun Fundamentals program. She also taught in Kent State's Graduate School of Management and holds a master's degree in speech communication from Kent State University. Everyone in attendance today has been muted to avoid background noise from any of the over 300 registered participants. We do encourage you to ask questions at any point during the hour. You can submit your questions in writing using the control panel on, your right, on the right side of your screen. I will present your questions to Deb as time permits throughout the hour. There is a handout available to you that summarizes today's presentation. It is located under the handouts tab on the control panel. We encourage you to download it and to take notes during to today's presentation. We are recording today's webinar and you will receive an email with a link to the recording after we conclude our time together. Before we begin, I would like to ask a question of you, our audience. And that question is true or false. My word choice affects how people perceive me. I'll give you about a minute to respond and then I will show the results. Okay, well, as we can see, overwhelmingly, um, everybody finds uh, that statement true. So, now that we saw those results, I would like to present Deborah Easton. Hi, Patrick. Good morning, everybody. So, that's a good sign. Everybody is aware of, of how uh, others perceive us. We're okay. <laughs> All right. Hopefully you heard the first comments, and that was good. That was good morning. So um, I'm glad to hear that everybody is aware of the fact that uh, our word choice does affect how people perceive us. It certainly affects how influential we can be. Now I probably should start with the bad news. Bad news is there aren't any magic words. Magic words that will just make people do what we want them to do. 
It's important, however, that we do take a look at word choice and whether or not we are as effective as we could possibly be. I wish I could give you guarantees on this, but it's my hope that in our time together this morning that there will be many suggestions here for enhancing word choice so that we can be as influential as possible. And in order to talk about this subject, we're going to divide it into two parts. First of all, we're going to talk about influential conversations, when I need something to happen as, as a result of the conversation. Once we have established that information, we'll then utilize some of those strategies and then talk about difficult conversations. The ones where uh, many of us hesitate because we're not sure how to word it. And sometimes we have a tendency to either be non-assertive, kind of beat around the bush about what we're saying in those conversations, or just be so upset that we say everything on our minds and then regret it later. So as we look at influential conversations, we're, we'll first be talking about getting results with the right words, when I really need something to happen. Then secondly, we'll take a look at the impact of that word choice, making sure that we're not overly blunt or demanding in that word choice in any way. Then when we talk about difficult conversations, we'll be talking about delivering criticism with clarity and tact. And this is not just for those of you in management roles out there, but anybody who's in a team environment, every once in a while, we we have to give coworkers and colleagues uh, feedback about how the team is functioning and what everyone on the team is doing. So. As we take a look at then uh, delivering criticism, we'll also talk about delivering bad news. They kind of go hand in hand. Some of the, the strategies come together with that. So these are the objectives for our time together this morning. And as Patrick said, as any questions arise, please feel free to type those in as we go through. So let's take a look at the first category then, influential conversations, the, the um, overview of, of what we need to think about in influencing. And the first thing that we need to take a look at is the fact that no communication takes place in a vacuum. The situation affects how people hear our words. Is it a tense situation? Has that increased their anxiety in any way? Anxiety is a potent emotion. It's, it's like it, it's a fog that gets in between the ears. It makes it hard for people to listen. It makes it hard for them to think straight. So the first question then is, is it a safe situation? You know, if you go home today and your significant other says to you, we need to talk. With that tone of voice, with with that timing, just as you're walking through the door, do you feel safe with the conversation that's about to happen? Are you going to be able to focus on the word choice in that situation? So when we think about safety, we have to think about timing. You know, hitting somebody as they walk through the door is probably not the best timing. What about the, the place for what we are about to say, especially when we talk about those difficult conversations and delivering bad news and delivering criticism, who else is around? Is, is anybody else going to be able to overhear this conversation? And of course, tone of voice. You'll hear that as we go through the, the number of examples that we'll be taking a look at in our time together. Tone of voice is absolutely critical. So it's important to think about the situation itself. No communication takes place in a vacuum. Then once we have set the, the correct environment for this conversation, we need to be aware of the fact that words create pictures for people. When we're communicating, oftentimes we're focused on what I want to say and how I want to say it. But the true determinant of success in that conversation is not the, the talker, but how the listener receives that message. So what pictures am I creating by the words I use? For example, here's a word, table. Picture a table. I venture to guess that some of you pictured a square table. Some of you pictured a round table. Some of you pictured a table that might be in the room with you. 
You may have pictured a table at home. Maybe it's a coffee table. Or maybe it's a table that you're putting into a PowerPoint slide, and it's a completely different concept of table. That seems like a very simple, concrete word, but it creates so many different pictures for people. So this is very, very important takeaway from this conversation is, am I aware of what pictures I am creating for people as I'm talking? It's the number one focus. All of the other strategies, we won't be able to even think about them if I'm not primarily thinking about what picture am I creating for my listener. Okay, now I have a question for you since we're talking about in influential conversations. I want to give you a, give you a moment to um, type in your answers to this question. How do you know if you have influenced someone? I'll give you a moment to type in your answers. Okay, we are getting a lot of uh, responses to this, Deb. Um, I'll just start reading them. Uh, facial expressions by their actions, when they have done what you needed them to do, when they follow you, they seem engaged by their body language, they reflect on what I have said, if their behaviors change. Uh, nope. Uh, so that's that I guess that's the majority of them right there. Okay, great. What you'll notice from that list that you all just generated is that you know you have influenced someone if you see something happen. Either a body language response or or as you said, you see somebody do something. You know, the funny thing is, a lot of times when we're trying to influence someone, we're focused on changing their minds, changing their attitudes. But how do you know if you've actually influenced? You see that attitude through behavior. So instead of worrying about trying to change the mind, what is the action that we want to see happen. And that, therefore, should be the focus of our word choice, is keeping it focused on action. So let's take a look at that for a moment, motivating action in people. If you need something to happen, then you must provide an example of the expected action. And notice, that's an example of the action. Take a look at this uh, no example. In other words, this one's not effective. I wish the team would be more helpful to each other. Okay, first of all, do I really want something to happen or am I just wishing on a star here? Secondly, what do I mean by helpful? I mean, think about the people you know. If you were to say to, to some people, I want you to go help out a coworker, some people would go over, sit down, hang out, and say, all right, I'm just going to sit here until you tell me if you need something. If you use that same phrase to another person, please go over and be helpful to a coworker, maybe that person's definition of helpful is, okay, get out of, the, get out of my way. You're doing it all wrong. I'm going to do this for you. Two completely opposite definitions of what helpful means. And this is oftentimes what, what frustrates people, is that we say, come on, Debbie, these are adults for crying out loud. How do they not know what we mean by being helpful to, to a team member? Well, let me tell you. There have been so many examples over the years I've, I've seen uh, people say to one another, you know, be friendlier with customers. Uh, a bank manager said that to people once. And one of his new employees decided, well, I'll just start hugging customers as they come in. I mean, he literally started hugging people because that was his definition of friendly. 
So we need to talk in specific examples of action. So we would want to turn this around to something like, whenever you have completed your own tasks, please ask a team member what action you can take to assist them. Notice, we're even coaching them on how to ask the question. Instead of just kind of doing a, a, a drive-by question of, hey, do you need anything? No, it's a specific question of what can I do to assist you? There's a difference there. Do you need anything? Most people answer those kinds of questions with just no, and then later regret that they didn't ask for help. But when I say, what action can I take to assist you, and then wait for the answer, it's amazing how people may say, you know what, I really could use your your assistance on this. I'm I'm struggling with with how to get this PowerPoint slide to have a little bit more um, interest to it. And you're good at that. What ideas do you have? Now we really have action happening and influence has taken place. So you can see from this that words that describe attitude or demeanor, they're, they're actually adjectives that actually describe the person. For example, if I say, I need you to be more professional, I can't tell you how many times I've had an example of managers who've said this to employees and they, they took a paycheck and went out and completely upgraded their wardrobe and the manager didn't mean dress at all when he was talking about professional. He was talking about walking in the building and just looking people in the eye and saying good morning. Or even uh, you know, be, be more responsible. I just had somebody the other day, we were talking about word choice in a program I was doing, and she said, oh, this is what the mistake I'm making. I keep telling the kids, you need to be more responsible in taking care of the dog. And so the response the kids gave her was, but mom, we play with the dog all the time. <laughs> that was their definition of taking care of the dog and being responsible. She meant feed them, walk them, clean up after them, those kinds of things. So all of these kinds of words, you know, be more creative. Well, that's basically like telling somebody to think outside the box. <laughs> Great. What does that mean? And if I do think outside the box and it's so far outside the box, are you going to tell me, no, we can't do that because we don't have the budget for it? Being specific, respectful. We all have a vision in our own minds of what respectful looks like. But is that the same picture that other people have of demonstrating respect? We see this all the time in customer service, generationally speaking. Um, generations of, of perhaps your, your, your grandparents, respectful customer service is taking time. For those of you who may be of millennial or Gen Z generation, respectful, respectful customer service is this needs to be done fast because I need to move on. So there's two complete opposite definitions of what action needs to take place in order to demonstrate respect. So this is a very, very important category. Go back, take a look at some of your emails. When you've been frustrated by somebody not doing something as a result of the email you sent, is it action focused? Is it very specific about what you expected to happen? And then as we take a look at making these requests and those emails, did you put a specific time frame in there as well? Because under misunderstandings about time is one of the most common reasons why we have conflict. You know, I was uh, guilty of this not so long ago. I had said to my husband, you know, we really need to reorganize the kitchen pantry. What I really meant was, on Saturday, I want to reorganize the kitchen pantry. <laughs> but I didn't say that. I just said, we really need to reorganize this. And he heard that as, yeah, you're right, that's something that needs done. Well, nothing happened as a result of my word choice. So it's the same as if you, you were to go to someone and say, at some point, could we talk about my idea? That's not assertive enough of making that request. We need to put the time frame in there and say something to the effect of, within the next week, I would like to discuss my idea for improving customer service. I have Tuesday open. What day and time work best for you? 
Now notice the components of, of that word choice. I've first of all set a parameter of within the next week. I will be flexible about that, but I want it to happen within the next week. I've also been clear about what the idea is because chances are I'm approaching a person who has 27 other things in mind. So what was that idea all about? Then I have assertively stated this is what's good for me, but then I have asked what can we negotiate that will work for you as well. So the, the, the parts of that statement are very clear about my expectations. There's more likely something will happen as a result of having made that particular request. So timing is also important, but our assertiveness is also important. We have a tendency to hint about what we need. Just like that comment I made my, to my husband ab, uh, about the kitchen pantry. Think about making statements like, I wish I had more time to finish this report. Is that a statement of, I really want more time? Or is that just wishful thinking? I'm just, just making that comment. I wish I had more time, but I realize I don't, so I'll just get it done. What are you really saying here? If you actually need more time to finish this report, then we need to say something to the effect of, I need more time to finish this report to include new information that I just received. How can we extend this deadline? And what I'd like you to notice in there in making the request is the why. You know, when I had asked that question earlier, uh, you know, about, uh, about how do you know if you've influenced someone, you see it happen. And why do people do what they do? Because they understand it's necessary. And in this particular word choice, we're putting that why in there. Not just, I need more time to finish this report. How can we extend the deadline? But here's why I need it. And I've given a reason that that is of an advantage to the person who could give me more time, you know, who could extend my deadline, that now I can include new information that I just received. It will be the most updated report. So therefore, there's a benefit to the person for doing what I'm asking them to do. And that's something that oftentimes we don't think about when we're making a request is I know what I want, what I need. And sometimes I state it that way. I, I just need more time to finish this report. That's all I say. I know that I need it. But what's in it for them? to get, give me this extra time for this deadline. That's a very, very important um, component to, to making assertive requests. Avoid hinting about it, say what you need. Then we also need to make sure that we're not stating it hesitantly. Something like, you're probably going to say no, but can I leave early today? You know, we must be concerned about uh, about the the request being too bold, or the fact that they're probably going to say no. So you're you're okay with that if it happens. But are you okay with it if it happens? You're probably going to say no. But can I leave early today? You know, here's the thing. Think about your approach to this person. What did they hear first? You're probably going to say no. You already put that picture in their head. Is that what you really wanted to do? Instead, we should be saying, I need to leave early today to pick up my daughter. Again, the why. What can I do to facilitate this request without having a negative impact on others? Notice, I'm willing to, to do my part to, to make this happen for me. And I'm also cognizant of the fact that my making this request will have impact on other people. That's simply being um, in a negotiation kind of mindset instead of a demanding kind of mindset. I still need to leave early today to pick up my daughter. That's very important. But 
let's talk about how we make this happen. Um, if I if I do go to pick her up, but there's an important meeting, maybe I bring her back to the office with me and and set her down at my desk um, with a tablet, I was going to say a coloring book, but boy, that just really tells you my age, doesn't it? But give her a tablet so that she's doing something while I get to attend the, the meeting. Any way you look at it, there's more possibility of the request getting a yes answer than the no answer that I may have received before. Okay, so at, at this point, what questions do you have? Um, Deb, we did have one come in. Um, if people still don't know what I ask of them, how should I word my follow-up message to them? Okay. All right. So if um, if they simply don't seem to understand the, the request that I'm making, uh, I don't want to uh, acknowledge that I'm having to say it for the second time. Okay. Let me say this again. All right. That would not be your best approach because you're drawing attention to the fact that we've had the conversation before instead of drawing attention to the action, which is what we've been talking about. So instead, you know, we want to keep it focused on, OK, so here's what needs to happen. And maybe this time I get a little more detailed with it and not with a sarcastic tone of voice that says, OK, let me list the steps that you need to go through to make this happen. Because your frustration level with having to repeat yourself will come into, into play. And we want to be very careful ab about that. So. Simply keep it redirected to the action. Um, ask in what ways you can clarify that action. Uh, provide an example of how you would go about it. Then ask them, how do you see yourself following through with this action? That's, again, more in that negotiation mindset that we were just talking about. The key here is to, again, keep it focused on the action. So what we don't want to do is make demands. Think about this. I and mean, here's another question for you that I'd like you to type your answer in. What is your reaction when someone says to you, you have to do anything? I'll give you a moment to type in your responses. Okay, Deb, we're getting a bunch of responses. Um, uh, somebody replied that no one can make me. Uh, no, I don't. It makes me feel defensive. No, I don't. Uh, to make it a priority. Uh, get defensive. Um, I don't want to. So that, that seems to be the uh, the overarching themes. Okay, great. So when someone says you have to, your first reaction is, I don't have to do anything, or to actually ask the question, why? <laughs> why is it that you think I have to do this right now? That word choice right there comes across as a power play. And our first reaction is to assert our own power in response. And so that why that I mentioned before becomes very, very important. Telling people why is what gains their agreement sooner and with deeper level of commitment. Even if they don't necessarily agree with it, they still feel like you've thought it through. 
you're not just saying you have to because I want you to and I think more of myself than I think of you. So therefore, you have to give in to me. So any kind of demanding word choice like that sets you up for pushback. And that's not something that, that we want to have to deal with either. So take a look at this example. You have to send the quotes to the customer today. I'm not dealing with them if you don't. That, that's borderline threatening right there. I'm not dealing with them if, if you don't. But when we're frustrated, when we feel like people aren't listening to us, our default mode is to go into power word choice. You have to. This is where you're going to get the pushback. Instead, the customer needs the quotes by 4 p.m. so they can receive fast delivery. Please notify me when they have been sent. I can then follow up with them first thing tomorrow morning. Look at all of the action that's taking place in that word choice. First of all, specific time frame, like we talked about, the customer needs them by 4 p.m. Here's the reason why. It's not just because this is a demanding customer. And sometimes you have coworkers that, you know, with demanding customers, they're thinking, I'm not giving in to these people because they are demanding. But there's a good reason why here. They want to receive fast delivery. Then we're following it up here. Please notify me when they have been sent. Okay. It doesn't say there, let me know when you did this. It says, please notify me when they have been sent, and here's why I want that notification. Not because I'm checking up on you, but because now I can follow up with the customer and make sure the customer is okay. So you notice that it avoids the reaction to our style when we're avoiding making demands. When people react to our style, they have an emotional response to us. We want them focused on what it is we're talking about, right? So <clears throat> this is the influential conversation part of this. Patrick? Okay, at this time, I am going to put up another poll question. It's another true or false question and that there is no good way to deliver criticism or bad news. Again, we'll give you about a minute to vote on that, and then we'll show the response. Okay, well, there's the result, and as you can see, the majority of people are saying that um, it is false. Because the truth needs to be told. I mean, think about your best friend. Why is that person your best friend? Because that person tells you the truth. And they have a way of doing it that it's maybe hard to hear, but you accept it from that person. And think about somebody in your life who never tells you the complete truth. You have a problem trusting that person because you always feel like there's something being left out. There's something that they're not saying. And and so trust is a very, very important part. I mean, think about uh, when we first started talking about what, in, how do you know if you've influenced somebody? Well, think about the people who influence you. It's somebody that you trust, that, that they're not asking you to do something that will be a detriment to you. Trust is a very, very important part of this. But delivering criticism with clarity and tact can be, a touchy thing to do if you have ever tried to offer what 
frequently known as constructive criticism to someone and you received a very defensive reaction, your first thought is, I'm not doing that again. But that's sometimes the, the defensive reaction that person gives is the way they protect themselves from hearing the truth. That doesn't mean it still doesn't need to be said. The problem that we have with delivering criticism with clarity and tact is that we need to be clear and tactful. And that's a balancing act. A lot of times we run this gamut from being overly vague, kind of hinting at it, hoping they get what we mean, to the other end of the spectrum where we're completely blunt. So let's take a look at vague and indirect phrases first. Saying something like, you know, don't take this personally, but... <laughs> You know, just that phrase right there, don't take this personally, is almost like a heads up. I'm about to say something that's really going to hurt. So why say that up front? Or um, passive aggressiveness. You know, a person who really wants to get promoted would get to work on time. Notice how the real issue there is I, I, I have a problem with this other person's tardiness. But no, I have to throw this whole thing in here about the, they want to get promoted because maybe this is something that that individual has been talking about. Now I'm going to hit that hot button. Why am I doing this? Well, because I'm being indirect uh, to, you know, kind of push a little button on them. Or saying something like, look, I realize we're all under stress. I mean, I've had my share of it, too, like yesterday when and then I go into this long story about how I've been under stress. And the next thing you know, this whole conversation is about me. And they're wondering, OK, are you trying to tell me something through the moral of this story? So trying to tell this story, showing empathy of like, I'm in your situation, too. But we go on and on and on about it. People have no idea what it is that we're talking about or this question. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Think about how you feel when somebody asks you that question. Are you sure this is what you want to do? You can just tell they don't believe this is what you should be doing, but they're asking a question instead of coming right out and saying it. So you're wondering, okay, should I go ahead and defend this idea or I, I mean I don't know what to do with that are you sure this is what you want to do so that's the vague side of it all right now let's take a look at blunt aggressive and overly sarcastic phrases to avoid things like even an engineer should be able to figure that one out <laughs> just kidding I don't know about you but but I've run into a number of people uh, throughout my life who use this technique. They make a statement and then say, just kidding, so that they basically are trying to get away with saying whatever they want to say. But by putting just kidding at the end of that, it's like, oh, can't you take a joke? You're so sensitive. This is actually an example of verbal aggression. Because I'm saying what I want to say, even an engineer should be able to figure that one out. I mean, that's a, that's a derogatory statement against that person. But now I put that just kidding on there and it implies, you know, if you have a good sense of humor or you're not overly sensitive, you let me verbally attack you like this. You will handle this gracefully. We need to remember that sarcasm is actually a hidden communication style. And as a hidden communication style, for sarcasm to work, people need to actually understand that this is truly a joke, take it as a joke, and don't perceive that there's actually a hidden message to it. It's the only way sarcasm actually is humor. This one is also an example of sarcasm. Hey, I don't mind doing your job for you the right way. What else do I have to do? <laughs> All right, obviously, there's an issue there for, with how I'm having to support this person. That's what I need to talk about, that action, not make this kind of comment. Or, I knew this wouldn't work. Here's what I would have done. That's the expert syndrome. I knew you were going to be wrong, but I decided to let you go ahead, try it on your own. Now we're going to do it my way. That's also a, a, an aggressive way of, of handling criticism. Um, then we have the bandwagon effect. 
everyone thinks you should be doing this job faster. It's it's implying that that there's all these other people on my side, on my bandwagon. I'm doing this for power's sake. But who the heck is everyone? Okay, that's all it is, is a power tactic. Or why do I always have to tell you to do this? The scorekeeping. I always have to tell you this. That, too, is a power play. And then we have this last statement. Now, think about tone of voice here. Okay, let me explain this one more time. That's not really that positive, but think of it this way. Okay, let me explain this one more time. I think that even you should be able to get it this time. Probably you're not not your best approach. Okay, so if this is not what we want to do with delivering criticism with clarity and tact, what do we want to do? Huh? Notice it comes back to that same strategy again. Action, but this time we're focusing on choices. The reason we're focusing, we've added this aspect about choices is because we need to help that person separate who they are from what they do. When people feel like they're being criticized as a person, oh, the defensiveness is huge. But if they can see it as, okay, you're not condemning me as a human being. You're simply saying, I, me I made the wrong choice here. I can fix that. So look at the difference between everyone keeps telling me that you're not a good team player. Notice the power play, plus you're not a good team player. You, as a person, there's something wrong with you. Look at the better approach. The team needs your input during meetings and therefore needs you to be there. What can be done to ensure your attendance at the meetings? See how this is really focused on what the issue is. We need them at the meetings. We need them participating in these meetings. We're also asking that question, what can be done to ensure this? So I'm not demanding you do it this way or else. It's what can be, can be done. I may find out that they have so many projects that they have competing meetings at that, that same time. And so now we can talk that through and focus on how to make a better choice of action. Same thing with this example. A person who really wants to get promoted would get to work on time. Okay, we already looked at that one as an inappropriate approach. Look at the better way of handling it. We need to talk about your late arrivals. That is what the issue is. I'm concerned that they are affecting your desire for promotion. How can this situation be improved? I'm asking them for, uh, for ideas of how can we fix this situation. You see how we're focused on let's make different choices here. How can we make those choices possible? Now, at this point, sometimes people ask me, okay, Debbie, but what do I do if the person has no ideas for how to fix the problem? Okay, now this is where you need to step in and state your expectations, but again, in behavioral action terms. So we would say something to the effect of, I understand that you have several projects. Attendance at the team meetings is mandatory. Since there is no scheduling conflict, even though you have these other projects, we need to discuss time management strategies so that you can attend the next meeting. So now we're talking about options, about, uh, about um, choices. What choices can we make? How can we manage their time better, make better choices there so that they can attend these meetings? You see how this is all about focusing on the solution, as opposed to focusing on the problem. And that's what people fear about, about being criticized, that, that, it, that this is going to be an hour-long conversation about everything that's wrong with them, you know, making this big, long list of everything that's wrong with this person, and they just have to sit there and listen to it. No, we're talking about this is what concerns me. Here's the choice as I see it affecting you. Now, Let's move on and talk about what we can do differently. How can we choose to handle this better? So that's the delivering criticism part of difficult conversations. Now, let's take a look at the delivering bad news, and you'll see that these kind of go hand in hand. 
First of all, keep in mind when delivering bad news, timing is everything. Okay, timing is everything. We need to think about what else is going on with this individual at this moment. Can they even hear this bad news at, at this moment? I think this next one, though, is really important to note. Bad news is any news that adversely affects the person's view of his or her future. Think about that for a minute. Bad news is any news that adversely affects the person's view of his or her future. Now think about what we said when we first started this. Words create pictures. Bad news is going to create this doom and gloom picture of the future. So therefore, bad news without a solution is truly bad news. Okay? So again, when you see how we talked about with delivering criticism, criticism, let's keep it focused on, on the solution. It's the same way with delivering bad news. And we also need to keep in mind that bad news delivered without an opportunity for reaction creates an unpredictable outcome. In other words, I can't go in there and give a speech on delivering bad news. I need this to be an interaction where the person has opportunity to respond. Okay, so let's look at, at these components. First of all, keep the focus on the future whenever possible. Instead of saying, we can't ship until the 15th, notice the negativity there. We can't ship. There's no future for you here until the 15th. Instead, we will ship on the 15th, right? There's an action happening on that day. And if possible, maybe we can put in another statement here. We will also ensure that our driver assists you in unloading. So there is that what's in it for them. There's, there's a, a motivation for them to be patient until the 15th when the shipment will, will uh, occur. So the negativity in the first one doesn't paint a positive picture of the future in any, in any way. Now, think about this recommendation. State the facts without exaggeration. This is an actual quote in a meeting I attended because a client asked me to sit in on their meetings and um, to observe why they get such negative reactions from people. <laughs> this is what the manager said. Look, there's no way to sugarcoat this. Healthcare costs are sky high, so you'll be seeing a larger deduction out of your paycheck to cover this increase. Well, yay. <laughs> I mean, come on, that's bad news, all right? We still have to deliver the message that there's going to be a larger deduction, but there's a better way of doing it. Look at this. Healthcare costs have risen dramatically. The why came up front. Be assured that we will continue to offer health insurance. Good news, part of the future, followed next. We will require an increase in employee contribution in order to cover the costs. Now we're going to get specific. The average additional deducted amount per paycheck is $25 per month. Now look at that picture. Immediately, people are picturing that $25. Bucks. The smokers are saying, okay, good, you just gave me a reason to stop smoking. Um, people who are drinking too much coffee are saying, okay, that means I stop uh, going into Starbucks so often so I can cover my health insurance. It's giving people that that opportunity to think about the future and, and what will happen, uh, how they can manage this bad news. That's what people need to hear. Bad news without a solution is truly bad news. Okay, now when we're delivering this bad news, we need to make sure they have an opportunity for response. So we need to empathize with their situation. But this empathy doesn't mean I have to turn myself into Dr. Phil and, and say things like, I can imagine that this is a tragic situation for you. Who doesn't need to, to be that drastic. Empathy simply, in most cases, means giving the person a moment to think and then giving them an opportunity to respond. I also don't want to be blunt by, about this by saying, look, it is what it is. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard heard people say that because they don't know how to handle people's reaction to bad news. So it's, it is what it is. Suck it up. Get get over it. Okay. Or say saying statements like, you're not the only one affected by this, you know. You know, that implies, so quit your crying about it. Look, human beings have emotional reactions to bad news. So ask for what the reaction is. Like, simply, what questions do you have about this information? Or, do you need more time to think about this before we discuss this further? That's the safety factor of the uh, of the conversation that we talked about when when we first started this webinar. Do you need a minute to let this sink in? They might not even know what questions to ask until they can get out of the emotional side of their brain and go into the rational side. And and most importantly, asking what other solutions do you have in mind? These are important um, components of delivering bad news, of, uh, of difficult conversations, remembering that it's not about me making a speech. It's about having an interaction with people. Usually, people are concerned about how people will respond to this. So what questions do you have about delivering bad news, um, about delivering criticism? I'll give you a moment to think about that and then type in what your questions are. Okay, Deb, uh, the first question, any advice for those who may be too introverted and may not be able to directly express themselves? Yes. Um, I am an introvert who does an extrovert's job. <laughs> when I take all of those personality tests, I am an introvert. And there are moments when I really have to draw on my training to get myself to speak up when I need to and not be overly hesitant uh, uh, about saying what I what I need to say for those fellow introverts out there it is a matter of of thinking about some of the situations where you've had the most difficulty in the past, kind of categorizing them. Don't get too bogged down in the specifics of that specific example. But what in general was it? Was it having to deliver bad news, for example? Okay, where were your hesitancies? Now, now take some of these, these strategies that we've talked about and practice it first in email. In your written communication, you have not only the opportunity to edit, but to ask somebody else whom you feel handles delivering bad news with tact and clarity. Have them look it over. Have a partner in this and, and uh, learn the different word choice. That really helps. Usually what causes hesitancy for we introverts is not knowing how to say it. So, so thinking about those situations when you're not in the middle of it, you know, just, just do a little journaling even uh, um, where you sit down and say, okay, this is something in the past. I really don't want to have a replay on this again. So what would I say differently? I think that's very important for those of us who are inter introverted because, it, like I said, it's usually how to say it that causes our hesitancy. Okay. Uh, we have a few questions um, that are basically the same about how do you handle it when a person gets highly emotional or confrontational or does not agree with the feedback you're giving them? Okay. Remember that their emotion does not need to become my emotion. Okay. This is their reaction to the situation. I can acknowledge that by saying this is obviously an upsetting situation. They may come back with some smart aleck remark like, well, duh, you think so? You know, that's okay because if they respond that way, they heard you. <laughs> and that's not a bad thing because when people are all emotional, they can't even listen to what the other person in the conversation is even saying. So let the reaction kind of come right by you. You don't have to absorb the emotion yourself. 
keep it focused on the solution. What, let's keep it focused on what can we do differently? What other choices do we have? So that's the best way of handling the emotional side of it. Now, if you have a person who just absolutely does not agree with you, remember what we said when we first started here. Stop trying to change the mind. Get it focused on action. Forgive me, but I'm about to quote Dr. Phil. <laughs> he often says, you can act your way to an attitude change. And, and that's quite true. It, it's, it's pretty much basic human psychology. Instead of, instead of um, debating the denial, no, this isn't happening, no, this isn't happening, turn the conversation to the choice, the future choice. Well, let's talk about what, what steps we can take. If you still have a person who is resistant to, to taking those steps, then I wouldn't keep badgering in, in this conversation. Sometimes you have to step away from an emotional conversation because they're so locked into the emotional side of their brain, they just can't think straight. So simply say, you know what, we have discussed the same items three times in this conversation. I think it would be best if we both take a step back. Let's get together again on Wednesday at 2 p.m. Notice I'm setting a specific time and let's specifically talk about what options that we we have for moving forward. If on Wednesday at 2 p.m. they still have no ideas, they still refuse to accept your ideas, then you are at a point where you will need to state clearly what you will be doing and how you will from this point forward be reacting to to the choices that they are making. In other words, the choices that they refuse to change. You know, what will your response to that be? That is not a threat. It is simply, this is how I will need to react and how I will need to respond because I do not have your, your agreement on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for just one more question. Um, a couple people have asking, um, any, of any additional resources like books or podcasts or any other resources where they can get some more information about this topic? Yes, there is a, a, a book out there. And for some reason, the author always the name will escape me until we all get off air and then I'll know what it is. But it's it's called Say It Right the First Time. Um, there are also a number of good books on questions. You may have noticed how many times throughout my examples the the alternative actually involved a question. And there is a book called Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. And uh, the author talks in that book about how asking people for these solutions, for example, getting them generating the ideas, it makes them think it's their idea. Therefore, they're very much influenced by their own idea instead of somebody telling them what they have to do. And so those two resources, say it right the first time, and change your questions, change your life would be my two, uh, my top two recommendations. Okay. Okay. All right. And so to summarize what we have, uh, what we have been talking about, please remember, talk in terms of action. If influence, you know you've influenced somebody by the fact that they have done something, then make sure we're talking in action. Keep solution focus as opposed to who went wrong, uh, who's to blame, all of that. Keep it focused on solutions whenever possible. Say what you mean. Tactfulness requires truth, okay? Truth does not mean bluntness, right? But say what you mean. Consider how the listener will hear the message. Remember, we need to keep the situation in mind. And ask yourself, what pictures am I creating with my words? I hope that I have created some pictures for you about what influential word choice looks like. Okay. Uh, thanks, Deb. Good stuff as always. Uh, but that does conclude our time together. If you would like to learn more about today's topic or any of our other programs, we encourage you to contact us at 330 Six seven two three four one six, or at your training partner at kent.edu. We are able to bring all of our programs on site to your location and tailor them to fit your needs. 
Uh, Deborah does have some public open enrollment programs coming up this spring. Her next program is Enhancing Interpersonal Communication Skills on Tuesday, February 18th at the Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio, which is located in Independence. You can join our extensive list of clients and bring Kent State to your organization. We also encourage you to register for our next webinar, which is on Friday, February 21st, when we will be discussing coaching for top performance with Kent State facilitator Amy Shannon. During this webinar, we will discuss how to identify the responsibilities of a coach, recognize the three core interpersonal skills for effective coaching, understand the difference between feedback and feed forward, and also learn a three-step coaching model for use in any situation, um, especially effective with a defensive employee. For those attending live, you will be asked to complete a short survey. Please complete this survey so that we will be assured that we are bringing you the most usable and relevant content possible. You will also receive a follow-up email in the next couple days with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Kent State Center for Corporate and Professional Development and our facilitator, Deborah Easton, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.